Mr. McCoy here with part nine of Escaping the Giant Wave. As I plunged through the scrub brush, I remembered Darren jumping into my sea picture and wrecking it. I thought about my list of summer goals. Oh, Darren, I thought, I wanted to stop your bullying, but I didn't want it to happen this way. I didn't want you to die. I looked back, but could no longer see the ocean or the horizon in the distance. The trees were thick now, mixed groves of tall Douglas fir, alder, cedar, and others that I couldn't identify. The undergrowth was thicker too, with prickly vines that grabbed at my pant legs. Fallen branches, rocks, and mounds of decomposing leaves made the ground uneven. With all the smoke in the air, dusk arrived early, giving the woods a forbidding look. Josie stopped running so suddenly that I almost bumped into her. My legs can't carry me one step farther in these bushes, she said, her breath coming in gasps. I'm going to sit here on this big rock and wait. Then I'll wait with you, Norm said. You kids take our flashlights and keep going. Uh, it'll be pitch dark soon. He and Josie both held flashlights out to us. I'm going to stay with you, Bebe said. Your legs are younger than ours, honey, Josie said. You're healthy and strong. You can keep running. Go as far as you can. We'll take one light, I said. You keep the other one. Good luck, Norm said. Now go. Thank you, I said as I took Norm's flashlight. Thank you for everything. Bibi and I ran on, not knowing what was ahead of us and not caring. All I cared about was putting as much distance as I could between us and the next giant wave. Before, when I had made the decision to come up the hill, I had known that a tsunami had terrible destructive power. But now, I had seen that force with my own eyes. Fear that comes from personal experience is far more real than fear based on someone else's ordeal. What is your take on this line? Fear that comes from personal experience is far more real than fear based on someone else's ordeal. Do you agree with that? Share with your fellow listener. As darkness wrapped around us, we slowed down some. I wasn't sure how far inland we'd run. Half a mile? Maybe even a mile. When I ran laps around the track at school, I always set a goal and then counted the laps. Knowing there were only three more to go, then two more, then one, made it easier to finish even when I was so tired I didn't think I could make it. I wished I could count down now. How much longer did we need to run? How far would we would be far enough? The woods stretched on, seemingly forever. Beside me I heard BB panting and wondered how long she would last. My own legs were so tired that I was having trouble running through the undergrowth now, and her legs were shorter than mine. Are you okay? I asked. I can't run much more. I, I wish we could have stayed with Josie and Norm. It's safer to keep going. My feet hurt and my arms are all scratched up. Her words started as a sentence and turned into a whine. I knew if I encouraged her to talk any more, she'd soon be in tears. B.B. rarely cries at home unless she's overtired. Now, she was not only weary, but also scared and in danger. I didn't blame her for being weepy. I felt like crying myself. Shh, I said. We'll stop for a few seconds to catch our breath and listen. Maybe we'll hear the signal that it's safe to go back. What if we hear another wave coming? Then we'll run some more darkness surrounded us now, and although the pool of light from the flashlight made it possible to keep going without bumping into a tree, it also made me feel more vulnerable. We couldn't see beyond the light, but anything in the woods nearby could see us. We stood in the middle of nowhere, listening to the darkness. I didn't hear any all-clear signal, but even if it was sounding, I wasn't sure it would carry this far. We were a long way from Fisher Beach now, and even farther from the town of Fisher, and there were huge trees to mute the sound. Maybe the speakers that broadcast the warnings and the all-clears had already been washed away by the first big wave. Maybe the people who monitored tsunamis were gone. I listened some more. I didn't hear the all-clear signal, but I didn't hear another wave approaching either. What I did hear were twigs snapping 
and brush breaking as someone or something came through the trees toward us. Bibi clutched my arm. Something's coming. Hello, I called. Who's there? The noise came closer. I couldn't see the source of the noise. Bibi inched around until she stood behind me, then peeked over my shoulder. I kept the flashlight pointed toward the noise. Two bright eyes glowed in the gloom. Who or what do you think this is? Share your prediction with your fellow listener. Is it a grizzly bear? B.B. asked. No, it's too short. It's too short to be a human, but I didn't say that. What else lived in the woods? A mountain lion's eyes would be about that high. So would a coyote's. Maybe it was a bear cub and the mother bear was right behind it, ready to protect her baby. I swallowed hard. I would wait until the animal was close enough so I could tell what it was. Then I planned to clap my hands and shout and try to scare it away. Another twig snapped. The eyes advanced. My light picked up a tuft of tan fur and two floppy ears. Pansy? I said. The little terrier gave a happy yip. It's Pansy, B.B. said. Here, Pansy. Giddy with relief, I laughed as Pansy ran toward us, jumping over the low-lying bushes and snapping twigs. Pansy, B.B. dropped to her knees and hugged the dog. Pansy slurped B.B.'s face as her tail whipped back and forth. She must have pulled the leash out of Josie's hand and run after us, B.B. said. I can't believe she would leave Norm and Josie. Norm said she loves kids. Maybe she just wanted to be with us. I shined the light back and forth in the woods where Pansy had come from, thinking Norm and Josie would follow Pansy and try to catch her. Norm, I called. Josie? There was no answer. Maybe Josie truly couldn't walk any farther. We need to go on, I told B.B. We've rested long enough. We can't keep running now. We can't leave Pansy by herself. Pansy will come with us. If she has trouble getting through the bushes, I'll carry her the way Norm did. I want to hold her leash. That's when I realized that Pansy's red leash was not dangling from her collar. The leash is gone, I said. Maybe Norm and Josie had purposely let Pansy come after us so that she would be farther away if the tsunami hit. Maybe they were hoping to save their little dog. Uh, Maybe they were hoping their dog would be safe, whether they themselves were not. I felt bad for Norm and Josie, knowing they would be worried about Pansy. They'd been so kind to us. I wish I had a way to let them know that Pansy found us and that we would take care of her and bring her back when the danger was over. That is, we'd bring her back if we survived. We went deeper into the trees. I felt as if I were having a nightmare, the kind where I know I'm in danger and it's imperative to run and run away, but I can't seem to make my legs work. I wished I had paid more attention to the maps of the Oregon coast that Dad had shown us when we were planning this trip. In particular, I wondered what lay ahead, what lay straight east of Fisher Beach. If we were running away from the ocean, and I hoped we were still going in that direction, although I knew it was possible that by now we were disoriented and going around in circles, I wished I knew what was ahead of us. Would we eventually come to a road, a town, farms, or did these lonely woods go on for miles? Pansy stopped. Come, Pansy, B.B. said. This way... The terrier, who moments before had willingly trotted along beside us, now stood stiff-legged, refusing to budge. Is she hurt? I asked. Is her paw caught in a bramble? I shined the light on Pansy. The dog was shaking with fear. It's okay, Pansy, I said. Woof! A sharp bark made me jump and sent a shiver of premonition up my back. Did Pansy sense something that I couldn't yet know? Woof! 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 was the same bark Pansy had given just before the tsunami hit. Another wave is coming, Phoebe said. I swung the flashlight in a circle looking for a safe place to wait. 
We were near a large tree, a giant old growth cedar. I ran to the tree and put both arms straight out sideways. The tree trunk went from the fingertips of one hand to the fingertips of the other. Come here, I said. We're going to stand on the far side of this big tree. If another wave comes, the tree will protect us. It was a sturdy shield, but would it really be strong enough to protect us from a tsunami? Bibi followed me back to the back side of the tree. Stand as close to it as you can, I said. Press up against the bark. Bibi stepped up on a large root that angled away from the bottom of the tree and leaned her forehead against the trunk. I turned off the light and put it in my pocket, then gathered the terrified dog in my arms and stood directly behind Bibi. I felt Bibi's shoulder shake and knew she was crying. Turn around, I said. Put your back against the tree and face me. We're going to make a dog sandwich. Bibi turned, wiping her nose on the back of one hand. Dog sandwich? You and I are the bread and Pansy's the filling in the middle, I said. Bibi put her arms around Pansy. Good dog, she whispered. You're a good, good dog. Pansy's tail swished against me as she licked the tears from Bibi's cheeks. I wondered how I could make up a silly joke about a dog sandwich when I feared we were going to die any minute. Still, my words had helped. Bibi wasn't crying anymore, and now that we were holding her close, Pansy had stopped shaking. If disaster strikes, I thought, I've spent my last few minutes on Earth hugging a dog and calming my sister's fear. Those are good things, but I didn't want these to be my last minutes on Earth. I didn't want to die making a dog sandwich or running through the woods or any other way. I wanted to live. I wanted to survive the tsunami and find Mom and Dad and go back home to Kansas. I wanted to play baseball and hang out with my friends and read some good books and ride my scooter and I heard what Pansy must have heard a few minutes earlier. Here it comes, Bibi said. Huddled behind the tree and listened to the second giant wave roar toward us. I could tell from the sound that it was higher than the first one had been and coming farther inland. Pansy began to tremble again. It's coming over the top of the hill, Bibi shouted. I tightened my hold on Pansy and pushed even closer to Bibi. I heard trees crash to the ground and for one awful moment, I had feared we had made a terrible mistake by staying behind the big cedar tree. What if the force of the water pushed the tree over on top of us, trapping us beneath it? You think that is going to happen? Share your prediction with your fellow listener. And now a few moments more of escaping the giant wave. Well, it was too late to change my mind. The fastest runner in the world wouldn't be able to escape the wave when it was this close. The water thundered forward. I ducked my head down, shielding BB, and braced my legs to keep my balance. It's going to hit us, BB screamed. I should have run inland sooner, I thought. Instead of staying with Norm and Josie and watching the people on the beach with their bonfire, we should have kept going. We should have run as far and as fast as we could. The warning sign had said to go as high up and as far away from the water as possible. Why had I followed only half of the instructions? We'll find out what happens to Kyle, to BB, to Norm, to Josie, and yes, to Darren, as escaping the giant wave continues.